Hello, this is Tony Blazer for the Motocross Vault presented by Blinzall. If you're in the market for some high quality racing oil for your two stroke or four, make sure you go to blinzall.com and use our discount code VAULT20 to save 20% at checkout. Thank you for all the support. This is Jedi Hannah. This is Jedi Daily. This is Jedi Butters. Hello and welcome back to the Motocross Vault. My name is Tony Blazer and what this video is going to cover is a look back at a machine uh, that a lot of people probably didn't know existed. The 1978 Harley-Davidson MX250. Uh, if you're not real familiar with the era, depending on your age, you probably didn't even realize that Harley-Davidson actually built a motocross bike. They only made it really one year. They did have a very limited, and I mean limited, production model a couple years before that that was really just like a prototype to kind of dip their toe in the waters and see if any, uh, you know, their dealers were interested in supporting this. But in 1978, they came out with a full uh, motocross machine. They had a full motocross team. They had riders like Rocket Rex Staten on the machine, Rich Irestead, uh, Marty Tripes even rode one. And this was a serious motocross effort for a little while. And now Harley Davidson at the time was actually owned by AMF, which is uh, more known for bowling balls than motorcycles. Harley Davidson had nearly gone bankrupt in the late 60s and been bought out by AMF. And the 70s were really kind of a dark year for Harley Davidson. I think they kind of lost their identity a little bit. They were their lineup was a mix of, uh, you know, the traditional uh, Milwaukee Iron, the big Sportsters and electric glides and what have you. And then they also had a bunch of these little Italian bikes uh, they were selling, that, which were two strokes, believe it or not. Now this was done to kind of try and compete with the Japanese who had brought in all these low cost machines in the late 60s. And we're really kind of you know eating Harley's lunch, and they they had partnered with and had bought out a stake in a, an Italian company that built small little motorcycles and originally had been building planes, and they had used that to fill out their lineup with these small little inexpensive machines. In the mid 70s, though, uh, the real boom in the motorcycle industry was off road uh, motocross and off road riding in general was exploding in the U.S. There was much more places to ride back then. The bikes were very inexpensive. Uh, there were dozens and dozens of brands, much more competition than there is today. And Harley Davidson was anxious to try and get in on that. So they came out with a motocross program. Uh, they developed it over a couple of years. And in 78, they came out with this production model. It didn't really catch on. I mean, Harley Davidson, again, is mostly a street you know, machine. And people just didn't think of going to a Harley dealer. And I think the dealers didn't think of supporting it in the same way you would like a Honda dealer or something like that. So I think it was a bit of a harder sell. The bikes were a little more expensive. They, they were $16.95, which is about 10 to 20% more than most of the Japanese cost at the time. There was a lot of high quality component on the machine. It's much like, you know, the KT in the 80s where um, they were a little bit offbeat. Some of the quality of the components was higher than what you would have gotten in the Japanese, but the way they were set up, the performance really kind of wasn't there, and uh, people were maybe hesitant to uh, buy them when they didn't have the dealer support and they cost more to begin with. So this is going to be the story of that machine. If you like to support what I do here at the Motocross Vault, I have Motocross Vault merch available. I just came with an all-new design. Uh, somebody actually asked me to do one based on the 2003 KTM they owned and the 2002 Toyota Tacoma they had. And I, I think it turned out pretty well. It looks pretty cool. Did a little, little Grant Langston kind of tribute bike here in the back. I also just came out with another one a buddy of mine asked me to do, which is based on the uh, his 89 CR500 and a 1991 uh, GMC Cyclone, which is one of my all-time favorite cool trucks. But I have all kinds of designs, tons of bikes, bike truck combos, all kinds of stuff. And if you have something you'd like to see me do in the future, you know, just let me know. I'm happy to uh, do something special for you if I have the time. I'll put a link in the description below and there'll be a little card here in the video as well if you'd like to check that out and I would appreciate it. Uh, so here without further ado is the story of the 1978 Harley-Davidson MX250. Today, Harley-Davidson is at a crossroads. An aging customer base, shifting technologies, and a hugely competitive global market have many wondering if one of the most storied brands in motorcycling can survive long term. Long the symbol of America's love of freedom on two wheels, Harley Davidson will need to reinvent itself if it hopes to stay relevant in a world of ride sharing and alternative fuels. In the 1970s, Harley Davidson was also searching for a new identity. The late 60s were a difficult year for America's most iconic brand, and in 1969, they were saved from bankruptcy by recreational equipment giant American Machine and Foundry, or AMF. The AMF bailout saved the brand, but led to its own set of problems. Unfortunately, the AMF Harley-Davidson era became better known for labor struggles and shoddy quality than marketing success. Clashes between the motorcycle division and its new parent, combined with a lackluster product portfolio, led to one of the least loved eras for the brand. At the time, Harley-Davidson was struggling to find its true identity. 
Their portfolio was a rather eclectic mismatch of big American iron and small Italian runabouts. Iconic machines like the Sportster, Electroglide, and Superglide sat next to little two-strokes such as the Rapido 125 and Baja 100. Originally, this mix of products had come from Harley's desire to diversify their lineup in the early 60s. To do this, the brand had looked to the Italian firm Aeronautica Machi, which had gotten its start in 1913 as a manufacturer of airplanes. Later renamed Air Machi, the firm had become a successful motorcycle manufacturer after the Second World War. In 1960, Harley-Davidson purchased a 50% stake in Air Machi and used this affiliation to fill out their lineup with several versions of the small Italian two-strokes that were popular in Europe at the time. Unfortunately, this strategy would not prove wholly successful against the influx of lower-priced and higher-quality offerings from Japan. Within a few years, the Japanese would own the lower end of the market, with brands like AMF Harley-Davidson struggling to carve out a niche for their success. No longer thought of as a premium performance brand by most, and not really competitive as an entry-level mark, Harley-Davidson once again went looking for a new market to capitalize on. In the early 1970s, if you were looking to jumpstart your sales portfolio, one of the best bets in the motorcycle industry was motocross and off-road racing. At the time, both were enjoying a huge explosion in popularity in the United States, and the market was wide open. A huge variety of Japanese and European brands were available, and America's appetite for the lightweight and relatively inexpensive machines seemed limitless. Seeing this as an excellent opportunity to prop up their flagging sales, AMF Harley looked to their Italian partners to help develop a motocross machine for the American market. In 1975, Harley began production on a limited run of machines designed to gauge interest in a full-scale motocross effort. Only 65 units were built and made available to select dealers. Using a modified 242cc Airmachi street bike motor, the original MX250's most notable feature was its unique usage of a set of front forks for its rear suspension. While this bizarre arrangement worked fairly well, it did brand the machine as some sort of Rube Goldberg-style experiment. In the press and on the track, the initial MX250 machine met with very tepid success. Its performance was lackluster, and its quirky construction was more of a curiosity than a real selling point. It quickly became apparent that if Harley-Davidson was going to make a splash in motocross, they were going to need to become far more serious about the project. In 1976, Harley stepped up their game by hiring Rocket Rex Staten to be a test rider for the fledgling program. Staten was a very fast pro from Southern California at the time, and he had earned a reputation as one of the hardest riding men in motocross. His name lent legitimacy to the race program, and his hard-charging riding style helped the brand work out the bugs inherent to any new racing program. With Rocket Rex at the controls and a diverse collection of resources at their command, AMF Harley-Davidson prepared to take a second stab at the lucrative American motocross market. For this second attempt at a competitive motocross racer, Harley looked to suppliers from all over the world for its components. Assembled by Air Machi in Varese, Italy, the bike used electrical and suspension components from Japan, an Italian motor, a German frame, hubs from France, laced to rims from Spain. It may have borne an American name on the tank, but the MX250 was truly an international machine. With the original MX250, one of the most disappointing features had been its underpowered motor. The hopped-up Italian street bike engine offered a mellow delivery that was fine for riding trails, but far too tame for motocross. Knowing they did not want to repeat this error, Harley looked to Aramachi to breathe a bit more fire into their proven two-stroke motor. As before, the 1978 MX250 used a modified version of the 242cc motor found on the SX250 Dual Sport. While this motor was well regarded for its reliability, its older design meant it lacked some of the features found on the competition. By 1978, all of the major players in the 250 class had adopted some sort of reed valve for their intakes. This innovation prevented the fuel charge from leaking back into the intake at low RPM and greatly aided engine response. Without a reed valve, it was more difficult to produce the kind of snappy low-end torque favored in most motocross designs. While the MX250 did lack this feature, it was fairly modern in other respects. In order to lower the weight and improve the cooling of the motor, the new engine used a chrome liner instead of iron. The new motor also featured much more aggressive porting than the dual sport version, and an all-new piston and head that boosted compression. In order to feed more fuel and air into the motor, Harley ditched the SX250's puny 32mm mixer and bolted on a huge 38mm Dell Order carburetor in its place. The ignition was hotter as well, and used either Dancy or Motoplate as the supplier. Finishing off the motor package was a large uppipe and a straight-through motocross-style silencer. On the dyno, the new Harley mill pumped out a very solid 32 horsepower. 
This was a fairly impressive number in 1978 and put it right in the ballpark with most of its 250 rivals. On paper, the Italian mill looked to be a real winner. On the track, however, it was less so. While its peak power was plentiful, the breadth of that power left a lot to be desired. The motor suffered from the dreaded all-or-nothing delivery common to racing two-strokes in the days before reed valves and variable exhaust ports became ubiquitous. When it was on the pipe, the MX250 could hang with anything, but if you let it fall off the power band, it was difficult to get back into the meat of its power. It ran very much like a large 125, with all of its usable power located high up in the rev band. Low-end torque was virtually non-existent, with mid-range thrust being only marginally better. In order to get the most out of the Italian mill, a rider had to keep the Harley pinned at all times and carry lots of momentum. Not aiding matters in that regard was the MX250's grabby and difficult-to-use clutch. It was not a fan of constant abuse and proved difficult to modulate properly. With its narrow power band and cranky clutch, getting the most out of the MX250's motor took skill and patience. While the motor turned out to be a bit of a mixed bag, the suspension on the MX250 was actually quite good for the time. Unlike its funky predecessor, the 78 version had suspension which was perfectly conventional for the time. For its componentry, Harley looked to Kiaba of Japan and specced out the same basic units found in the well-regarded RM250. The 36mm legs offered 9 inches of travel and a leading axle design for improved steering precision. In the rear, the MX250 used Kiaba's top-of-the-line remote reservoir dual shocks, which were also shared with the RM, and they punched out a similar 9 inches of travel. On the track, the MX250 offered an extremely plush ride both front and rear on small chop, but was not fond of any big impacts. Large jumps or high-speed whoops used up all of its travel fairly easily. When Harley set up the MX250, they had decided to use the same spring rates found in Suzuki's RMs, which weighed significantly less than the Harley's 247 pounds. This translated to suspension which was excellent for off-road and trail use, but less than optimal for hardcore motocross. With only 9 inches of travel available, the Harley also offered significantly less movement than machines like the CR250, which were already approaching a full foot of movement in 78. With an upgrade in spring rates and some oil fiddling, the MX250 suspension could be excellent, but in stock condition, it was better suited to play riding than racing. Its 247 pounds were a full 24 pounds heavier than the CR250 in 1978, and this difference could be felt in the track. It did give it a very planted feel in corners, where its soft front forks let the front dive and take a bite. Overall turning manners were quite good, and the machine's rather soft low to mid power helped it hook up on slick surfaces. As long as you did not let it come on the pipe mid-corner and upset the chassis, the MX250 was a sure handler. If you grabbed too much throttle, however, and the light switch power kicked in, it could be difficult to control. On a motocross course, its soft suspension and hefty weight worked against the machine, and the MX tended to wallow rather than float over the terrain. Big whoops caused the suspension to blow through their travel, and it was easy to get in over your head if you attacked the track too aggressively. This, of course, caused a bit of an issue, as the motor demanded a go-for-broke attitude that the chassis and suspension did not support. At speed, the MX250 was actually quite stable, and the longest 58-inch wheelbase made the bike a solid desert sled. The close ratio 5-speed gearbox was not ideal for bombing across the desert, but there was very little head shake, and the bike made an excellent off-roader with some gearing changes. Once you dialed in the suspension, the MX250 became a very capable handler. It was far too heavy to actually be called nimble, but it turned well and did not do anything unexpected or scary at speed. In the detailing department, the 1978 Harley-Davidson MX250 was surprisingly well finished for a boutique motorcycle. The fit and finish were very good, with quality welds and hand-assembled craftsmanship. Features like the leather strap tank, rubber damped cylinder fins, injection molded fenders, and spring-loaded chain guide tensioner showed the Italian's attention to details. Everything from the forged Tomaselli levers and controls to the premium Akron shoulderless rims was top quality for the time and a step above the Japanese fare. While the braking at the front was excellent, most testers did find the rear unit underpowered for the bike's substantial weight. The side plates were also panned for their shape and brittle construction. Both sides bulged out annoyingly and broke far too easily. The expansion chamber was also panned for its shape, which stuck out wider than the tank and tended to roast the rider's legs in long races. After five years, countless thousands of dollars, and less than 1,000 units sold, AMF Harley-Davidson decided to halt the work on their motocross program at the end of the 78 season. The factory motocross team of Rex Staten, Marty Tripes, and Rich Airstead were shut down, and the remaining MX250s were blown out of the dealer's inventory at well below their $16.95 retail price.
The dream of an American motocross machine was once again shelved as Harley moved their focus back to dirt track and the proven performance of their XR750 twins. As good as the MX250 was for an all-new machine, it was just not up to competing with the Japanese without several more costly years of development. At the time, this was a cost the struggling brand could not endure, and the decision was made to sell off the Italian operation to the Castagoloni brothers of Italy, who renamed the operation Kajiva. Today, the MX250 stands as an interesting footnote to one of the more colorful eras in motocross. If it had endured and had a chance to continue development, perhaps it could have been a legitimate American motocross power. But unfortunately, economic problems at home and internal fighting at AMF Harley doomed the MX250 to failure before it could ever really get started. So there you have it. That's a look back at the 1978 Harley-Davidson MX250, a machine that unfortunately was probably doomed to failure from the start. I don't think the Harley people really understood the off-road market. I'm sure there was a few people there who were, you know, into trying to make this work. But the overall company, AMF, again, was not a, they're not a motorcycle company. They weren't motorcycle people. They had all kinds of internal struggles going on in the 70s at AMF. Uh, they had issues with labor strikes and what have you. And there just were problems with quality and all kinds of issues, even on the street bike side. The 70s were a dark period for Harley-Davidson. Uh, they'd almost gone bankrupt in the 60s, and they pretty much, you know, failed again in the 70s. Really, it was only, you know, by the skin of their teeth that they bailed things out and kind of pulled it out in the 80s. It was really a, a tough call there. And uh, I just I just don't think they had the room on their plate for this motocross endeavor. When things were maybe not taking hold initially, they weren't getting that huge response they were hoping for. It was pretty easy for them to cut bait there and leave. Now, Kajiva, who would end up being the company that came out of this uh, Air Machi sailing uh, by Harley Davidson would, of course, go on to you know win world titles in the 80s, be one of the more successful brands. Ends up buying Husqvarna. The current Husqvarna may not even be around if it wasn't for this whole thing. You got to figure Harley Davidson gets sold to Kajiva. Kajiva buys Husqvarna when they go out of business. Eventually, Husqvarna gets bought by KTM. So it's an interesting through line there, uh, all the way back from this MX250 to you know the current you know Husqvarna you ride today. Uh, there's a little bit of that heritage there that goes all the way back there. So it's an interesting story. Now, it is a machine I've never been able to ride myself. It would have been cool to take one of these things for a spin. Um, and they're pretty rare now. There weren't a lot of them. They only sold, I think, about 900 originally. And you can only imagine there probably aren't too many of them that are still around. God knows how you get parts for them if something goes wrong. I, I saw somebody said that like a Fender, an original Fender for one of these things, which I believe was built, uh, produced by Nova, which is no longer around. Um, they go for like 1500 bucks. So if you have OEM stuff for this bike, it's it's pretty rare and pretty expensive. So definitely one of these bikes, if you have it, you probably want to leave it in the corner of the room. You don't want to ride it because you may not be able to get parts if you break it. So if you like this sort of thing, make sure you check out the other videos I've done. If you could like, subscribe, and uh, share on social media, I would really appreciate it. Ding that little bell. Uh, tell your friends about the channel. I would definitely appreciate that as well. So until we meet again, this is Tony Blazer from the Motocross Vault. Keep the rubber side down. Peace.